All right, thanks, George. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's so, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I confess, I think I would rather be there in person than where I am right now because of the temperature. But um, I've not been to Naples before, but I'm imagining that this might be what your neighborhood looks like. I, I'm not sure, but correct me if I'm wrong, because at least this is what Hollywood Beach looked like about two weeks ago when I was there. Um, where I am, the best way to describe it is if you go outside and you get in your car and you aim north, <laughs> you aim at Washington, D.C., but when you get there, you keep on going. So it's about 1,600 miles away. And if you want to drive all in one day, it'll take you about 24 hours. But I don't think you want to do that in February because this is what my backyard looks like right now. Temperatures around 32 degrees, and that's freezing. And that's actually a mild winter day here. And we're used to it, but at least one thing we don't have uh, that you probably may is iguanas falling out of the trees when it gets that cold. <laughs> yeah. Right. So um, I'm, I'm going to give my presentation today in, in two parts, and I'm going to try to stop in the middle and maybe answer one or two questions uh, if, if we have time. Um, and the first part, I want to talk about uh, cameras and equipment and give you some tips on how you can get extra mileage out of the video that you shoot. So here's a, a, an illustration of some of the video cameras, the camcorders that I've had uh, over the past few years. The first one I got, first commercial camcorder, uh, the bottom right corner, that Panasonic Wow, it's a VHSC. It was a, a tape um, tape mechanism, and it was about the size of a football. And it weighed a lot, and it was clunky, and it was awkward. But you know, even though it, it shot uh, low resolution video, uh, some of the moments I captured with that camera are still precious to me. It was my kids when they were young, and a few other things. So it, it gave me the idea that video isn't necessarily about the equipment you have, it's, it's the moments that you can capture. Um, <coughs> the other cameras that you see there, the Sanyo and the Canon, were um, a couple of recent ones I got. The Sanyo was probably my favorite camera of all time because of the pistol grip. You kind of held it vertically, unlike other camcorders. And the specs at the time were ahead of their time from Sanyo. Uh, the Canon, the Canon Vixia in the lower left, also one of my favorite cameras. And that was because of the size and the portability. And around then, people would ask me, what's a good camera that I should invest in? What, what camcorder should I buy? And my answer was usually the same. Buy something that's portable and that you could put in your pocket. Reason is, I, I travel a lot and I shoot a lot of video when I travel. And believe me, the, the best thing to have with you is something small, discreet, and something you can put in your pocket or your bag or your purse. So small to me was better. The Sony camera that you see there, that's my current camera, uh, my best camera these days, and the one I use when I do um, sh uh, shots for clients. It's a fantastic camera. The resolution is outstanding. It shoots 4K video. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better camera. When I travel, I don't bring it. Again, because it's a little too big and it's a little too awkward for me. So best camera I own, and what do I do when I go traveling? I bring my iPhone. So the iPhone actually is a great camera. And here are some of the reasons why I think the iPhone is a fantastic device. First of all, it's always with you. So when you're traveling, you've got your phone. It's, in your, it's there in your pocket. It's there in your bag. It's light. It's portable. It's easy to carry. Optical quality, fantastic. The new iPhones, they give you multiple cameras. So you have a telephoto, you have a wide, and maybe a super wide. It shoots 4K video. We're gonna talk a little bit about 4K and why that's a good thing to do. In addition to 4K, slow-mo, time-lapse, things like that. And if all else fails, it's a great still camera. You can take fantastic photos. 
And the final thing is it's really easy to accessorize. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about the accessories that you can get for your iPhone to make it a little bit better. Of course, it isn't perfect. Um, first of all, there is no continuous optical zoom. Um, if you're used to shooting with a camcorder, that could be a big deal because you just cannot get close to some of your subjects. So even though you have a telephoto, a two times telephoto lens in there, it isn't quite the same thing. Low light could be a little bit better. In bright light, in sunlight, outdoors, wow, that screen can be really hard to see. So it's, it can be pretty tough even to see whether you've started shooting video or not because it's almost impossible. Battery life could be better. And finally, capacity, and that depends on how big an iPhone you have, um, how much storage you bought. If you have an older phone, say 32 or 64 gigs, well, you're going to maybe run out of room pretty fast. My current phone, I do not have an iPhone 11, but my current phone is the 10X Max, and I bought it with 512 gigabytes. So I'm pretty safe, but your mileage may vary. And here are some of the things to consider. If you go into the settings on your phone and you look at what you can shoot with that camera, you can shoot anything from 720p up to 4K. We're going to look in a couple minutes at what those numbers mean and, and what kinds of resolutions they are. But for right now, just look down below at how much space that video can take up. So if you shot a minute of video at 720p, the lowest resolution your phone will do, 40 megabytes. That's reasonable. If you go to the other end of the scale and you shoot 4K at 60 frames per second, you're up to 400 megabytes. So you can imagine if you're shooting for an afternoon, how much capacity you're going to need. So let's look at those resolutions. Um, if you look at the bottom right corner, there's something called SD, that's standard definition. And you remember that camera that Panasonic I showed you, the one that was as big as a football, that was the resolution at the time, the maximum resolution, 640 pixels wide by 480 pixels high, 640 by 480. The next cameras I owned, um, could shoot 720p. And that's the definition, the, the minimum of high definition. So the resolution now is 1280 pixels wide by 720 pixels high. And that's the reason it's called 720p, because of the height, the number of pixels of height. The next resolution up is full HD, and that's 1920 by 1080 or 1080p, because we're talking again about the height. So in each of those sizes, you can see that there's a lot more pixels crammed into each of those frames. And finally, at the, at the top is 4K. It's called 4K because the width is about 3,840 pixels wide, or roughly 4,000 or 4K and the pixel height is 2160. So technically you could call 4K 2160p, but it isn't. So why is this all important? Why is resolution such a big deal? Well, I'll show you an example of uh, a, a, a video that I shot in Thailand. So the outer dimensions is 3840 by 2160. That's a four, full 4K frame video. And inside, I have inset a 1920 by 1080 frame. Why is that important? Well, when I'm editing at home, I can crop a 4K video and cut a 1920 by 1080 piece out of it. And if I export that video as a final uh, resolution of 1080p, I haven't lost anything every one of my shots is 1920 by 1080 and they are full resolution. If you export at 4K resolution, that's a different thing, but I don't usually do that. Um, 
4K editing and 4K video sizes are pretty big, but if you're doing something for yourself, showing um, in your own living room or you're posting stuff online or on Smug Mug or something like that, well, 1080p is more than enough. So let's look at that frame again. And here's two ways that I could have cropped that frame uh, when I got home in post-production. So first of all, there's the full-size frame, and then two ways of cropping it at 1920 by 1080. And 1920 by 1080 is actually one quarter the resolution of a full 4K video. So in, in, in other words, instead of getting one shot and exporting my video as 4K, instead of getting one shot, I can come home with three different shots that I can use later in editing. So 4K is very versatile if you have the capacity and if you have the right phone, phone to do it. Here are a couple of other examples. Both of these shots, um, I've taken a 1080, 1920 by 1080 frame out of each one. So you probably recognize the bottom frame. I shot that uh, some years back in Alligator Alley. And instead of that wide shot, which you have to get with your iPhone because you don't have that zoom, zoom capability that I talked about, you can crop and you can do sort of a zoom and come up with a better composition and a better shot. So when you fire up your camera app and you're ready to record, here's what you normally see. And there's that big red round button on the right-hand side. And of course, when you press that, that changes into a square button. And that says, I am now recording. Now remember when I said the screen sometimes is difficult to see in bright light? Well, I've had so many cases where I thought I'd press the button and I thought I was recording, but I couldn't see whether that button changed from round to square. I wasn't really recording. So sometimes you have to be careful. But the point I wanna make here is if you look at the bottom right corner, a new button appears and that's a, a round white button. You're probably aware of it, but some people aren't. And that means that you can press that button anytime as you're recording video and take a still photo. That's pretty neat. You don't have to stop recording. You shoot video at the same time as you're taking still photos. Here's a couple of examples. These are still frames that I took as I was shooting video in different places. The thing to note here is back to that resolution, 3840 by 2160. If you do the math, you come up with 8 million as the area of each of those photos in terms of pixels, square pixels. In other words, eight megapixels. Each of those photos is an eight megapixel photo that I snapped at the same time as I was shooting video. And really, eight megapixels, I just turned the clock back uh, not many years, uh, eight megapixel cameras were considered pretty good, state of the art. Um, obviously, that's gone up since, but those photos are certainly good for posting on social media, even printing in a scrapbook and a whole If you forget to press that white button and you don't take the photo at the same time as you shot video, there are programs, applications that will do that after the fact. So uh, my absolute favorite is something called Snap Motion. It's on the Mac App Store. It's not very expensive. And all you have to do is take that video that you shot, in this case, a 4K video, 3840 by 2160, drag it into the application, and then scrub through until you find exactly the right frame you want and capture it. And then drag it onto your desktop and you have an eight megapixel photo. Very neat. Um, there are similar um, applications for iOS also. One that I've had a little success with is Perfect Pick. Um, but there's, there are always new ones appearing. So best thing to do is um, explore in the App Store and see what you can come up with. But Snap Motion for the Mac especially, I, I really recommend. So I 
there are some of the things you could do with your phone when you're shooting video, um, but you can make your phone even better with some accessories. And I want, want to take a couple of minutes to talk about those. First of all, uh, I always travel and I always shoot with a protective case. Now you're going to find a, a lot of uh, lens kits and other things that will tell you how easy it is to put on and off and you don't need a case. Well, please don't, don't shoot video without a case. It is so easy to drop your phone into the water, uh, off a building. I can't tell you how many times it's been close for me and that wrist strap or a lanyard that you attach to your case has saved me. In fact, there was one time I had um, a, a leash on um, one of my uh, monopods that I had a camcorder on and um, we were on an elephant safari in India and I had it sitting on the saddle and I was shooting with my phone and I had put my camcorder down with the monopod on the saddle and I could feel it sliding as I was taking a shot with my iPhone and sure enough it slid right off the saddle and I thought oh dear I can imagine what that uh, camera is going to look like after an elephant has stepped on it. Fortunately I had a leash, a tether on it, and um, I could easily pull it back and I was safe. But please, don't, don't gamble with your phone. Um, another thing I really like is an ergonomic grip, and I'm going to show you examples of these things. Portable tripods, if they're easy to carry and, and if you can put them in your bag, wonderful thing to have. And um, sound, um, a, an external microphone and a light kit, if you're in the mood. So um, a leash or a lanyard and uh, a case that you can actually attach it to. I'm not recommending some of these products necessarily. Um, they were my favorites when I bought them, but since then there have been so many new cases and new many, uh, so many new leashes that the best thing to do is uh, use Amazon. Amazon is your friend um, and just search for cases with a little place where you can attach um, either a, a lanyard or, or a little string that you can hold on to. The Peak Design uh, products there, I still recommend those, particularly if you're using a camcorder or a still camera. They're very rugged, they're easy to attach, they're versatile, um, and not very expensive. This thing is a grip I mentioned. Um, this one was the shoulder pod. There are many others, again, out in the days, uh, search in Amazon and, and you're sure to find something. This one came in three pieces. First of all, there's the, um, the holder or the grip for the phone. The second piece is something you hold on to, number two there with your hand. Uh, three is a wrist strap and when you assemble everything, it sort of looks like that and you slide your phone in there, which means you can hold your phone and take video or even stills with one hand very comfortable, very easy to use, and again, uh, inexpensive. One thing to note with these, um, these are a magnet for TSA. So if you have one in your carry-on luggage and you're going through security, almost guaranteed that someone's gonna flag it and they're gonna wanna search your bag. And, and I've learned that from experience. So uh, when I'm traveling with one of these, I will remove it beforehand I'll put it in my pocket and I'll put it in that little tray before, before I go through security. And they always ask, what is this thing? And I have to explain it, but still, it's a really useful thing to have along with you. Tripods, again, a lot of them out there. Um, one of the favorites for a long time is the Joby Gorillapod. If you go to the Joby site, joby.com, um, there's lots of models. Um, there's a uh, uh, movable heads, and a lot of other stuff you can use. And again, searching in Amazon, you can come up with a lot of great portable tripods that are going to add a lot to your video shooting. Uh, external mic, light kit, again, lots of them on the market. Um, point I want to make is they're not terribly expensive. If you want to go that route and you want to uh, record a little better sound and, and maybe under darker conditions, then uh, a mic and light might be a good investment. There's a few other things that I found that are really good to have. 
first of all, a shooting buddy. And what I mean is, if you're traveling with your spouse or your kids or a friend, well, why don't you both shoot video? If you do that, you end up with twice as much video. You end up with someone who's looking at something maybe from a slightly different perspective than you are. And in the end, you'll have a lot more uh, different shots and a lot more good shots that you can edit with. Uh, I know I've traveled with uh, some people quite often and we pool our video and I'm so happy we've done that. A second iPhone or a camera is a really, really good thing. So when I upgrade my phone, I don't get rid of my old one, I keep it. And that is my second video camera. What I can do with that is if I'm traveling with someone and they don't have a very good iPhone, an older model, I can lend them mine and they can come up with better quality video. Um, the other thing that's, that's, that's good for is by the end of the day, sometimes your battery on your main phone has run down and you're getting low. So having that second phone is a useful thing because you can bring it out and you can keep on shooting. A lens pen or a microfiber cloth, easy to bring along, have in your pocket. Uh, cleaning your lens on a regular basis during the day is a good idea. Um, how many times have I accidentally put a fingerprint or a thumbprint on the lens, uh, and that's not a good thing. One of those portable chargers and a cable, also good. If you don't have that second iPhone with you to keep on shooting, well, just connect up that little pocket-sized portable charger and keep on going with your main phone. Um, the thing that I really, really value is a vest with big pockets. The, the one I have in this photo is from a company, a Canadian company called Tilly. Um, I know there's something like the uh, Scotty vest, also very good, but Tilly is the one that I prefer. There are so many pockets and there's so many big pockets and so many zippered pockets and Velcro pockets that are very secure. So if you have a wallet, a passport, money, whatever it is, you can also put in, uh, put, put your phone in, accessories, a whole lot of other stuff in those pockets, um, and also a, a small bag that you can carry additional things in. And the final thing I want to mention is lens kits. And we're going to talk about lens kits for a little bit because they give you extra versatility over and above the lenses that you already have in your phone. Some of the characteristics of a lens kit that you should look out for. Protective case, we've already talked about that, but you want something that's really easy to put on and take off. I've had lens kits where it's almost impossible to get that thing off. And that doesn't help you a lot because you don't always want that lens kit on after you've come back from a trip. You want to take it off and, and use something lighter and, and more compact and, and easy to put in your pocket. But if they're not easy to take off, then that kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, a wrist strap and accessories. We talked about that. Ease of use. A again, your lens kit should be something that feels natural. It's easy to use, seamless. Your lens choices, there are a lot of them out there. You can get telephoto lenses, wide angle, fish eyes, macro, circular polarizer, all these kinds of things. So if you have an older phone, particularly, that doesn't have um, the additional lenses in it, lens kits are a good way to go to add that capability. And finally, there's the optical quality of those lens kits. You see a lot of them out there. You'll see ads pop for stuff in Facebook or some of your social media. Um, well, a lot of these are inexpensive and they look really tempting. But frankly, um, the optical quality you get with them is not something that you're going to look back on happily. Here are some products that I can recommend because I've used them and I've been very happy with them. First of all, uh, this one is from a company called Stylus. That's spelled with a Z or a Z in your case. Um, the lens I'm showing you is a Revolver 6-in-1. It's about 50 bucks. Um, 
the lenses come in a squat little cylinder like a miniature hockey puck and it's magnetic and it attaches to a case that you also get with the system and it just snaps right on there and what you're doing is pulling the lenses out of the case and um, moving them into position over the lenses on your phone. So you have three individual lens kits in this one. And this is the one that um, I have and, and my wife has for her iPhone 10 and for my 10X Mac. And each of those um, pairs of lenses has two lenses in it, and there's a fisheye, telephoto, wide, macro, super macro. Um, they're not the highest of optical quality, but you know, they're actually surprisingly good. And, and if you're shooting photos or even video uh, for casual purposes to post on Facebook or, or just print, the quality is more than good enough. And you can get these uh, six in one lenses for uh, a variety of phones stretching all the way back, I think uh, almost to the 5S. So I, I'm not sure what they have for the iPhone 11, but if you go on stylus.com, you'll see what they have. Um, they also have another kit called the Z Prime. Um, it's a little more expensive. You can get a kit with two different lenses um, and a, an adapter for around a hundred bucks. Um, the adapter again is a magnetic adapter and the way this fits into place is in the picture on the left, you get a case and you get the adapter, again, magnetic adapter, and you take your lens and you snap it into that little hole in the adapter. And then you put thing, the, the thing together in a system like number four there, which snaps on magnetically onto the back of your phone and you just swing your lens in the position over your existing lens. Now, in this case, there aren't two lenses. There's only one. And in, in this instance, the iPhone XX Max, it only works with a regular camera, not with a telephoto camera. What I like about this system is the image quality is excellent. And I got to admit, it looks absolutely super cool. So if you're out there shooting video or stills and someone sees it, they're bound to ask you what you're, what you're using. So here's what you'll see if you're using one of those lenses. Um, image number one is with the regular lens on the iPhone XX Max. Image number two is using the telephoto lens. Three is with the wide angle lens with the Z prime system. And finally four is with the super wide, almost a fisheye lens with that system. Um, there's another one called the Allo clip. Uh, Allo clip has been around a long time. Um, very common and very good quality these days, at least. The earlier Allo clips I didn't have the highest confidence with, but the new Allo clip system is pretty good. Uh, you get a case, which is around $25. You get a lens and a clip that snaps onto the case for about $110. Um, and again, versatility and quality, very good. So look them up if that appeals to you. I have no problem recommending that. Iographer. Iographer.com. Um, they are an innovative company, and, and what they'll pride themselves on is being a portable studio. Um, their main system is um, this rig that you snap your iPhone into and then attach external lenses to that opening. And if you're shooting handhold, you can grip your iPhone inside that system with two hands and it gives you extra stability. And at the same time, it has cold shoes on the top that you can attach an external mic or a light kit. And on the bottom, you can attach to a tripod. So if you're out on assignment, for example, and you want to shoot an interview, your iographer is a really good system. Um, 
if you go on the iOngra for site, there's lots of tutorials, a lot of video tutorials for shooting video and how to use the system. It's around $130 for the lenses um, and the accessories. So have a look at that one. So if I wanted to sum up, when you're shooting with your iPhone and you're taking a photo, a photo captures an instant in time. It is a moment, it's a special moment, but it's only an instant of time. If you shoot video, a video clip captures more than an instant. It captures moments. It captures a stretch of time. And it's a living recreation of that particular instance, that experience, that adventure, and that moment. And what you can do with video, once you bring it back in your camera, is you can recreate a story. You can recreate those special experiences, which is why I find video so appealing and why I enjoy doing it so much. And uh, to close off, um, I'm just going to mention a few shooting tips for shooting better video. And in the second half of the presentation, we're going to come back to these and look at a couple of them in a little more detail. So the first tip is settings. Uh, if you're used to shooting stills and you have a DSLR or a good camera, then you know you can go in and you can adjust the aperture, the exposure, um, the, the uh, ISO, and a whole lot of things. Well, you can do the same thing with a camcorder or even your iPhone. My advice, particularly when you're starting in video, don't do it. Um, it's so easy to paralyze yourself and confuse yourself with settings. Uh, really, uh, the automatic setting in the iPhone, at least when you're beginning, is good enough. And you want to avoid anything that will slow you down and keep you from shooting. So keep it simple. Shoot the work simply means shoot as much video as you can. It's so easy to press that button and shoot video. If you look at it later and you don't like it, well, you can throw it away. But if you haven't shot it in the first place, you have nothing to edit. Stay composed. I, I like to frame my shots and compose my shot. Press the button and let just let the action come to me. Angles and sequences is something we're going to talk about um, in the second half. And uh, finally, when I say easy on the moves, um, you've seen Hollywood, you've seen TV, and um, you love those slow cinematic shots, the pans and the zooms and the camera movements. They're easy to do, but they're hard to do well. So at least at the beginning, as I said, compose your shot, stay still, press your button, let the action come to you. And finally, selfies. Hey, it's okay to include yourself in your shots. After all, we we said that video is living memories and you're, you are a part of that adventure. You are a part of that story. So why don't include yourself in those videos? Now the picture you're looking at uh, on this slide on the right hand side is when I mentioned uh, angles, when I mentioned um, getting into uh, a good composition, it, this is a shot in Barbados and this lady was doing a limbo on a flame, flaming limbo bar and um, I could stand there 25 feet back and just shoot that scene. But I thought, you know, as I mentioned, the iPhone does not have a zoom. So the best way of getting uh, a better look at that um, action is to get right in there and take a closer shot. So uh, here's a still shot. My wife took it as I was shooting. And here is the result of that shot in video.
So you got to agree that probably works a little bit better than that long shot. And it's not hard to do. You just have to be a little brave and get right in there and get the shot. So um, I've gone on for a while. Uh, I hope you've had a chance to digest some of that information. But uh, if you'd like to ask a couple questions about what I've talked about, now is your chance. Uh, change in, in enjoyment between standard definition and high definition. But yes. when I got a 4K set and I've played like 4K Blu-rays on it, I don't see the jump from high definition to 4K as significant as the jump from standard definition to high definition. Is that a personal experience or is that something scientific? Um, actually, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, 4K and all of the features that you can get on modern televisions, part of that is marketing. Uh, they want to sell new televisions. Um, some of the older televisions are just as good and, and it's hard to tell the difference. And quite frankly, you're, you have to be a real video file and have very good vision or get up really close to those displays to see a huge difference. You can see a difference, but I agree with you, it isn't huge. In terms of standard versus high def, uh, well, it, the, the, the quality is certainly noticeable when you make that jump from standard to high def. Uh, but as I mentioned before, even some of the video that I shot years and years ago with those old cameras, I, I play it back now and the aspect ratio is four by three and it looks clunky and the pixels are really big and it's soft and it's pixelated and, and it isn't great to look at, but you know, um, the memories that I captured with those videos, um, my kids when they were small or family holidays or birthday parties, things like that. So I forgive, um, the diminishing quality of that video, and I would trade that any day for the memories that I brought back. So uh, the short answer, yes, a big difference going to high def, and I agree with you, not a huge difference going to force. My second question has to do with the, the, the Hertz measurement on, on, on the picture. What will I see as being different between a 4K at 30 hertz and a 4K at 60 hertz. I'm not clear what the hertz factor means. Well, the frames per second, um, either 60 or 30, is basically how many still frames your iPhone is shooting every second. And, those, and the phone converts those still frames into a video. So if you're shooting at 60 frames per second, and later on, you want to play a little bit of that back in slow motion, it's going to be a lot smoother. Um, so in effect, what you're getting is a smoother video. Um, and again, a better option at um, slow motion. But again, in terms of whether you see a huge difference, like the difference between 4K and, and uh, high def, maybe you won't see a huge difference. Any other questions? How do you manage all of that data? You must have a big iCloud account. Uh, <laughs> that's a really good point. Uh, no, I don't have a big iCloud account. Um, I, imagine I, I, I manage it on external drives when I get back, and I'm, I can't count how many six terabyte and eight terabyte external, external drives I have. And the other um, challenge about managing it, even if you um, save and back up all of your data onto one drive, it isn't really safe until you have it on two drives. So um, I will buy drives in pairs and back up all my video in pairs of drives. Maybe that's a, an old school clunky way of doing it, but uh, at least it's always available and 
Um, I, I don't have to spend a lot of time uploading gigabytes and gigabytes and terabytes of data to the cloud. But it is a challenge keeping track of all that stuff, no question. Thank you. Yes. How do you move your video off your phone to your editing station or your desktop or Mac or laptop? Uh, I just use uh, the uh, application called Image Capture that comes with your um, Mac OS. Image Capture is actually pretty good. Um, there's a third party utility called iMazing, which is another really good one. You just connect your phone and you'll see all the photos and videos on your phone uh, in the, those applications. And you pick a, a place, a, a folder to move them into, press the button. And uh, you have to be a little bit patient because it will take a little time to move them off. But uh, either one of those things, image capture comes with the Mac OS or iMazing, another good application will do the job for you. Yeah, we actually have a meeting, uh, I think in May uh, on iMazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, is that it? So we can get back to uh, the presentation? Okay, Wally. Good. Okay, thanks for those questions. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper into shooting and editing. And I'm gonna show you a few examples from my own video files. And they're the kinds of things that anyone, any one of you can put together without a lot of trouble. Now it used to be that you needed a, a separate camera and maybe some really expensive equipment to make a movie. Uh, let me mute you for a second so I don't get that echo. Um, but these days, as I said, the iPhone is really the video camera you already have. It's, it's there with you. It's a mobile studio. Uh, you're carrying it in your pocket or your purse or your bag. So making a video isn't any more about having the best or the most expensive equipment, but it's really about being creative and your ability to tell a good story. So I think video's time has actually come. Facebook thinks so, and so does Google. Can I go? Here we go. Um, according to Facebook, 95% in the next five years. Well, I don't know if that's really the case, but um, I think whatever numbers finally come out, I think the smartphones have a lot to do with that. We finally maybe are getting more used to shooting video. It, it, it was, and, and it is still for many people, that when we go on holiday, we come back with hundreds and hundreds of still photos, but very little video. Um, so you got to get the habit of shooting video, pressing that red button and recording. And once you get the hang of it and you start doing it more often and you don't overthink things, you don't worry about how good it is, just doing it, you'll be able to come up with some really good stuff. Google says we're watching a billion hours of video every day on YouTube. Well, that's a lot. Um, so that tells me that indeed people are shooting and posting more. But if you look at YouTube or Facebook or things like that, Instagram, a lot of it is single shots or one-offs. So really it's pretty easy to grab your iPhone, aim it, start it and shoot a few seconds of your kids or your pet doing something funny and posting it on Facebook. And I'm not knocking that. I, I think it's a good start. It gets you in the habit and it gets you more comfortable with shooting video. But why not take that just a little bit further? Shoot more video, not just that one shot. Shoot more, shoot more shots, and then package some of them together into a minute or maybe two minutes of really engaging video. In other words, 
why not become a storyteller? So back to those tips that I mentioned before, staying composed was composing your shot, easy on the moves, don't go crazy with fancy pans and zooms, at least at the beginning, do it later when you're comfortable. But the things I wanna talk about are shoot the works, which is take a lot of shots, shoot a lot of video. If you have room in your camera, and you have a big iCloud account, or you have a terabyte drive, or you have enough uh, hard drive space on your computer, shoot the works, bring all that video back, and use it for editing. And the key thing for editing, the next two things I'm gonna talk about in detail are varying your shots. Put a lot of variety in the shots that you come back with. Play the angles and think sequences. And sequences really are the basis of good video. So let's talk about those things. First of all, um, here are some of the things that you can control when you shoot video. First is distance. Now this scene, it's, it's, I, I took it in Sedona, Arizona, and I shot this with my camcorder. Now, with a camcorder, remember, you have a continuous zoom. So if I want to get closer to my subject, it's easy. I just zoom in. With the iPhone, it's a little more difficult. I will actually have to walk closer to my subject or use uh, a lens kit or use one of those two times tele lenses in the phone. But I can vary my distance. So in this particular case, with my camcorder, here are different shots I could take just by varying the distance. So there's the longer shot, the medium shot. Number three is really a close up shot of what the artist is painting. And then four, five, and six are getting progressively closer to that person and zeroing in on a different aspect of the shot. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Second thing you can control is angle. Now, with this shot, um, I took this in Thailand. We're on a, a raft and we're being pulled across a, a, a little stream with this um, rope and pulley contra contraption. And simply by moving around the subject, I could change the angle of my shots. So here are the different shots that I took on that occasion. Every one of these is a still frame that I have taken from the video. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. You, you see how I've just moved around those two guys pulling the, 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 the wheel and the rope and every one of those come, gives me a different perspective and a different shot. And again, when I said use lots of footage and add variety to her shooting, I'm coming up with a lot more stuff that I can edit when I get back home. Another thing that you can change is the focus. And what I mean by that is, not whether your shot is in focus or out of focus, but rather what do I want the focus of attention to be in that shot for my audience? So also in Thailand, this lady is um, boiling silkworm cocoons and she's extracting silk thread from them. So in that shot, I can change the focus in this way. I can focus on her face, on the silk thread coming out, on the cocoons, or on the pot. So every one of those is a different focus on the same subject, okay? You can change a couple of those parameters at the same time. You can change the distance, angle, and focus at the same time. So for example, if you wanted to have a different angle on the pot, there are one, two, and three are ways of doing it. If you wanted to focus on the silk thread, number four is the way to do that. So every one of those things is giving us 
a different shot, a different video clip that we can come back and edit with. The final thing that you can control and that, that's a really good thing to shoot is their context. And by context, I mean, you, you've probably heard of things, uh, heard of terms like B-roll or cutaways. Well, B-roll is a term from uh, originally from, from um, news programs or news clips where um, the, the reporter was the A-roll or was giving the um, narration. And the B-roll is when you wanted to cut away from the reporter to something else that was happening and show a picture of what they're talking about. Well, B-roll or cutaways is really important for context to provide a sense of where you are in the video you shoot. So on that same day in Thailand, here are some contextual shots. First of all are, are the people on that raft. At the very back of that raft, or the front in this case, in shot number one, that's where those guys were uh, rotating that wheel and pulling that rope to, to cross the water. Uh, number two, again, is just what you see on the bank, number two and three. And then four, five, and six are what you see as you approach the studio where the uh, silk thread was being created by the artisan. So um, the, the reason you take those different shots using changes in distance, angle, and focus is because you want to create sequences. And sequences are really the key um, in editing video. So here's, here's a see, uh, synopsis of the day, uh, we, the afternoon we spent in Thailand. First of all, we took in number, frame number one, we took an ox cart ride, and then we, uh, and not one and two, and then we crossed the river on that raft, and finally we saw the artisans making silk thread. Now, I shot this footage with an, an iPhone 7 Plus. And um, on that same day, I also shot some footage with my Go, GoPro. I take my GoPro along with me. So whether you shoot just with your iPhone or a second camera, or maybe you have that video buddy that I mentioned shooting some footage, it just adds to the, uh, uh, the variety you have when you come back. The original clips I shot were all about eight to 10 seconds long. But to edit them, I trimmed them all down, the best ones, to maybe two, three, maybe four seconds, depending on the style and the pace of my final video. And then I assembled them into strings of several clips. Sequences, they're same subject, but different shots. And we'll look at sequences in a minute. And then I added those contextual elements as transitions or bridges in between the different sequences, B-roll in other words. So um, that might sound like a little complex. So I, I'm gonna show you this animation that I made to give you the idea of changing your variety, coming up with different clips, putting them together in sequences, and then adding beginning, ending, and coming up with a video. So here's editing step by step. Come on. So those are all sequences then you can change the order of those sequences, make your story flow naturally. Here's where your cutaways and B-roll come in. Music, really important. So music and sound really bring your video to life. Opening sequence, title, closing sequence, and finally export share to QuickTime.
Where did we go? I've lost my keynote. There we go. Okay. So now I want to show you an actual the actual video that I put together from those clips that I shot from our day in Thailand. And what I try to do in a video like this, remember before I said I want to recreate the experience. I want to give the viewer, you, the audience, a sense of what it was actually like being there and going through that experience. And, and music is very important to recreating that experience. Now, I could have taken one single shot of each of those things and shown it to you. And yeah, you kind of would have got the idea. But by mixing up my shots, adding the variety and editing in sequence, um, I can give you a much better picture of what it was like. Now, normally, I would aim for a final video of about two or three minutes long. If it's more than that, my audience is going to get bored. They're going to lose some interest because four, five, ten minutes is a long video. But the one I'm going to show you right now is a bit over three minutes and, and maybe longer than I'd like. So you got to hang in there. But I wanted to show it to you because it really illustrates a lot of the ideas I just talked about. So watch for the different kinds of shots, the sequences, and the transitions in between them.
I'm sorry. What's happening is I'm getting. Well, let's carry on. Sorry, we couldn't finish that, but I, I'm getting um, a message that uh, on my computer that's telling me that a, a process is running a mock, and should I quit it? And I say, let it go, and it seems to knock me out of keynote. Anyway, I think you get the idea. By watching that video, um, I think you got a lot better sense of the experience that I had uh, than by one or two simple shots. And it was really very simple. None of that was very complex. They were, they were all very simple shots. Um, not a lot of fancy pans and zooms and stuff like that. Just those basics of distance, angle, focus, and context. And all it takes is um, some imagination and some willingness to try uh, to get in different positions and take different shots. So I, uh, you're probably asking, well, how do you edit something like this? When you get back to the uh, editing table, how, what, what's the process to put this together? Well, I've got good news and some bad news. I'll, I'll give you the bad news first. Um, there isn't really an instruction book on how to edit clips together in a creative way. Being creative, I don't know if it's something you can actually teach or whether it's something that you grow into as you get used to something and you find different ways of doing things. But there is really good news. Uh, and that is that you probably, all of you probably already know how to edit video. You just don't realize it. The thing is that most people lack confidence the first few times they piece together a movie. And they're not sure whether where to start or what clips go together well, but it doesn't really have to go to be that way. Believe it or not, we're all fully trained video editors. Fully trained, really. Think about it. We started watching movies and TV shows, commercials, when we were barely out of diapers. So by now, um, most of us, I think, can sense almost instinctively what flows naturally on screen and what doesn't. Really, osmosis is a wonderful thing. So the next time you tackle an editing project, trust your judgment. Try things out you might surprise yourself how well you adapt. Whether it's iMovie or Final Cut Pro, give it a shot. So that Thailand video was an example of recreating an experience. And I'm going to show you some other examples and styles of videos. And I want to give you some ideas for things that you can try on your own. Now, the projects I normally do for clients, I do video promos, I do training videos, I do documentary features, even music videos. For myself, I love traveling and I love making travel videos. And I think travel videos are really good examples of what anybody can do by themselves. The nice thing about travel videos, they don't have to be perfect. There doesn't have to be a lot of pressure on you. When you're traveling, you've got your iPhone out and you're shooting stuff, remember, it isn't Hollywood. You can't plan every shot. You, you don't have a detailed script. You don't have lots of time to get every shot right. When you're traveling, you're trying to grab every shot you can. So enjoy the travel, enjoy the sights, enjoy the moment, take some shots. But when you come back, you can relive that experience and you can have those memories more than once. So here's some of the examples that I'm gonna show you. First of all, we're gonna show you how to produce a movie trailer, you make a highlight reel, um, establish a theme and try to explore it, come up with some mood video, and finally tell that story that we talked about before. So the first one I'm gonna show you is a movie trailer. 
Now here's an example of a movie trailer. This is still shot from it. And this is just a, a collection of still shots, or not still shots, of uh, video clips. This is a still shot from them th that I took on the Vegas Strip. And I used the iMovie trailers feature to do this little video. So have a look. It's only about 45 seconds long. Right, so that was a strip and that was Fremont Street. And that was an iMovie trailer. So if you open iMovie and you go into new and you pick movie trailers, what you'll see is a lot of themes or templates that you can use to create those kinds of little movies. Now all of the movies are about 45 seconds up to maybe a minute and a half long. Uh, the theme that I used for that particular one was one called Action. And what the themes give you is a look and a feel, artwork, music, transitions, and special effects. It's like a recipe, okay? All you have to do is add one ingredient, your own video clips, and iMovie does all the rest. So here's how it works. Um, Here's a shot list, and you can see the various shots that this theme wants you to take. There's some landscapes, groups, close-ups, etc. You don't have to worry about that. All you have to do is shoot stuff. You don't even have to follow the script if you don't want to. In fact, for, for Vegas, I didn't follow a script. I already had the shots. Um, the themes that you'll see, most of them are, are about people, kids, families, dogs, stuff like that but you don't have to follow their scripts. Again, as I said, in the Vegas trailer, the hero of my movie was Las Vegas. It wasn't a person. Well, yeah, Elvis made an appearance, but it was really about the glitz and the glitter of the strip. So on the storyboard panel, you drop your own clips into those little spaces and you write your own text to go into the text areas and the transitions are done for you, export your video and you have a really professional looking movie that'll impress your friends. They'll be amazed at what you did. They'll think you're a genius. Another thing you can do if you have Final Cut Pro is you can export your trailer to Final Cut Pro and add your own creative touches. And I'll show you an example. Um, I exported a trailer to Final Cut. I added a few things and came up with this from the Balloon Fiesta in Albuquerque, New Mexico.
Right. Well, that's pretty neat. So now we're going to make a highlight reel. Um, and this is a lot like an iMovie trailer, except for one thing. You're on your own now. There aren't any prefab templates or themes or anything else. So if you just take the best of the clips that you shot, the ones that are most visual, maybe have the most action, the, the most scenes or the moments that you want to remember. Um, and you, you could have shot these things not necessarily on one day or two days or on one holiday, but over several weeks, even years, okay? Um, different places. Just collect them all. Isolate the best pieces. Remember, we wanted to find uh, individual clips or maybe one, two, three seconds long. Um, so if your movie, and they don't have to be chronological order, okay? So if your movie, for example, is about what we did last summer, you don't have to show May and then June and then July. It can be in any order you want. Um, use some animated transitions to bridge between your sequences. And there's lots of uh, nice transitions in iMovie and Final Cut Pro. And again, music is going to make or break some of these things. So find some music that's really evocative, that you enjoy listening to, because when you're editing, you're going to hear that music over and over again until you've finally completed your video. So find something you like. Um, and away we go. So here are some clips from a trip that I took to Hawaii. And using just the highlights, I was able to compress a two-week trip into two minutes. Right. So, of course, you recognize the music from Hawaii Five-O, and, and I put it in here on purpose, because if I were posting this video widely, uh, I would have chosen royalty-free or Creative Commons music, and there's a lot of it out there if you search for it. For personal uses, when I show something to my friends, or, I mean, you're all friends here today, so... I have no problem using uh, the theme from Hawaii Five O, but if if you do it publicly, then be a little bit careful about the music you choose. So um, that highlight reel I showed you, it's all about again mixing up your shots, distance, angle, focus, and context. Of course, music in that one played a really important part, and the transitions and the special effects that are all in iMovie and Final Cut Pro. So it's nothing fancy that you have to do. It's being creative and picking the transitions. 
So the next video I'm going to show you is exploring a theme. In this case, um, what you want to do is pick a single theme or a topic and develop it. Once again, music is going to be really important, so pick the right music to set your mood. Now, this uh, takes place in Amsterdam. Uh, if you've been to Amsterdam, you know it's a city of water and bridges and canals and bicycles. Lots and lots and lice, lots of bicycles. Bicycles rule in Amsterdam. So what I shot was a lot of B-roll, just contextual footage of bicycles from different angles. And here's what I ended up with. Um, Fietsen, incidentally, is the Dutch word for bicycle. Okay.
So, time to stop talking or go on for the rest of the afternoon, but I can't leave you without a shameless plug. Um, if you enjoyed some of the video tips you heard today and you want to know more, uh, you can grab a copy of my interactive ebook in the iTunes store. Um, it's full of tips and tricks and pictures and clips from my travels, and I had a ball writing it. It seemed that at the time, every book on video that I came across was aimed at the serious movie maker. There was lots of stuff on budget, scripting, acting, lighting, studio setups, and stuff like that but not really helpful for people who just wanted to make casual videos or do it for the enjoyment. So I decided to write one and I tried to keep the content simple, fun, and easy to follow. It's not an expensive book. It's about the cost of a medium pizza. So um, I have a chapter on shooting with a lot more tips. There's also a chapter on editing and a whole lot more too. So, I hope you had fun with those and maybe I gave you hopefully some ideas for your next video and I would love to see what you come up with. So once you've finished your masterpiece, please drop me a line and show me what you've done. Uh, George and Eckhart have my coordinates. So until next time, thanks for the invite. Thank you very, very good. Thanks, Laurie. Have a great day. Good program. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Thanks, George. Thank you.